Okay. The DHS website went through some changes recently. So every link um, pretty much reset. We've gone through the handbook and updated the links, but if you find anything that needs to be corrected, please let us know. We want to get that fixed as soon as possible. Um, and you can send that to the RA account. A lot of our changes um, are actually existing requirements. They're not changes to policy, but they are just clarifications of existing requirements. So in 1.1, we're discussing that you are required to provide these services by IDEA. Those are your initial requirements for this program. MA reimbursement can follow when certain um, things fall into place, like the medical necessity, the medical authorization, parental consent, et cetera. It is not guaranteed that you can bill for these services that you are providing you are required to provide them anyway. The unrestricted indirect cost rate is something that we get a lot of questions about, so we've clarified it in the handbook um, in a couple of places. So in 1.3b, we've put it under the AFR because that's where you're going to be applying for it. So you apply for it in the annual financial report and it helps boost your reimbursement. It's not a requirement that you apply for it, but it's something that helps you. It cannot hurt you. We really encourage that you are communicating between departments in your school district. So special education departments, business managers, working together to make sure that you have appropriate staff on your cost pool lists for random moment time study, following through for those cost reports, but also not including anyone who is in the UICR calculation because that is double dipping of federal funds. So there needs to be clear communication about that. We also added this new column in the um, UICR chart. So that is applying where it gets applied to the MAC reimbursements. It's not new information, it's just new in the chart. Um, we realized that it got left out, so we added that in. Ending participation. I mean, we always hope that you're not going to leave participation with us, but we know it happens for any number of reasons um, and you're allowed. So. What you need to do for us, though, is let us know as soon as possible so that we can help you through your ending participation uh, requirements. Some of them, as you'll take note, take uh, place after the close of the fiscal year. So you're still required to do your cost settlement. We can keep you in those notifications, make sure that you're meeting those cost reporting requirements after you're no longer on our contact list. Um, so you need to let us know as soon as possible so we can update our records. This one should be helpful when you're putting together your IEP ratios and running those eligibility um, checks. So this is an actual screenshot that you would see in promise of a student's eligibility. That HCB01 children's benefit package is what you are looking for. And that means, yes, these services are covered. You'll see that there's another Medicaid line up there with the MHX. That's a non-Medicaid category. So it can still show up, but that means no on your IEP ratio checks. Because this student has both, the yes overrides the no. Then you also see the other or additional payer. Those are the TPL. That's the third party liability insurance that the student has outside of Medicaid. And sometimes it can affect billing. We saw that happen this year, um, but it should not occur on the level that it did. So if you're seeing those mass denials for that reason again, we can look into that for you. Okay, so here's another one about your rates. So rate calculations happen on a yearly basis. 
They are based on your prior year's cost settlement information, but sometimes you won't get a cost settlement either because you didn't participate fully, you were in a payback situation, um, maybe you left participation. If we have two full fiscal years of no cost settlement information, we need new data to, to calculate those rates. So we added that in here as well. MAC. MAC is federal reimbursement all the way through. Your FAI funds are not considered federal reimbursement. Because they go to PDE and then to you in your FAI account, that is not considered federal funds. But the MAC is, it goes directly into your bank account, and you would have to report that as federal funds in those requirements. When no current banking uh, information is available, it's going to delay your payment. We really highly recommend that you go into SAP and make sure that your banking information is up to date and um, do that maybe on a quarterly basis, I'm not sure, but you're getting quarterly reimbursements there, so I would recommend checking every quarter. Oops. Okay, this clarification was just to add that these um, letters about your response rates can come on a quarterly basis. This is because it's a quarterly time study, it was just not clear before. Here we have the actual list of questions that you will get in a random moment time study moment. Um, it's just verbatim changes. So the questions have not really changed. Um, this is just letting you know exactly what a participant will see in that moment. What's going on here? What's up a second? That are, uh, there we go. <laughs> go back to here. Yeah. All right. Hey, it's me again. Here to talk about updated CMS guidance. We've been kind of talking about some of these things um, already this afternoon, and we're just going to carry through with a few, a little bit more information at this point. So go to the next. All right. So again, we talked about the fact that May 2023 is when CMS put out this new guidance, um, which all of the states are required to come into compliance by the beginning of 2026. So some of the things that you'll see in this new issue of the handbook that is hot off the presses has to do with evaluations, specialized transportation, and the random moment time study. Oh my gosh. Where'd we go? Next one. There we go. All right. Evaluation. Put it on the keyboard. So we've spent countless amounts of time over the years talking about, um, you know, when Medicaid will and will not pay for an evaluation. Um, one of the key pieces of CMS's new guidance is really looking at services in schools through the lens of the EPSDT program or benefit, which is the benefit that covers all Medicaid eligible children and allows that they are eligible for pretty much anything. If it's in our state plan, they can have it and as frequently as necessary. So as a result of that, that means that if your student has an evaluation for occupational therapy, let's call it a reeval for the moment. And when they do that reevaluation, it's determined that that student has met their goals and no longer needs occupational therapy services. Right now, we haven't allowed you to get reimbursed for that because we're checking for ongoing services, right? We've included that qualifier previously because CMS told us, well, you know, the evaluation has to result in services. No, the evaluation is a diagnostic tool. Imagine all these years later, early, periodic, 
uh, screening, diagnostic, and treatment service, right? That is EPSDT. So we're finally getting around to being able to truly look at evaluations as a diagnostic. So that's one piece of it. Um, also, we've had a number of issues over the years as we tried to pull apart what is meant by initial evaluation and reevaluation from an education perspective and a Medicaid perspective. And those two things have not been friendly to one another. So as of October 1, there will be no distinction. There will be evaluations. They will be on a limit now. So right now you have a, an initial evaluation, you can do bill for one every 180 days, and you can bill for a reevaluation one every 30 days. The only limitation moving forward is going to be that 30 day. Um, and I think I'm probably stealing some of your thunder, Devin, but um, <laughs> because there'll be more pages about this. Um, so we hope um, that this will allow you to you know, move through and see more in terms of interim payments as you're doing these evaluations. And I wanna also clarify, initial psych evaluation must result in an IEP, full stop. Isn't that fun? Right? It doesn't, if the student, because we are still, because our program is still designed for and specific to students with IEPs, that is the, that is the sole requirement that remains for that evaluation to be billable. All right. What's up next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know, see, we got all excited about evaluations and now we're gonna talk about transportation. Um, so we did talk about this. Um, we, we've talked about it a little bit through the day today, but this is one area where, you know, it's like CMS gives and they take away. Um, and so they are really narrowing the definition for specialized transportation. Um, and, so just because a student has um, occupational therapy on his or her IEP doesn't mean that they should have specialized transportation. If So what they're looking for specifically are vehicular accommodations, but there are also environmental accommodations that are noted. So if you have a student who is a severe asthmatic and cannot travel in a regular school bus because he or she has to have air conditioning, that is an environmental accommodation. If you have a student with autism who is an elopement risk and could get off a bus of 30 kids and no one would know, that is an environmental adaptation okay but again we are and so that's why when Devin starts talking about the revised Medoth form um, you'll see that change in terms of what we're looking for with regard to transportation we're looking for what that accommodation is because that's what CMS is telling us we need to know in order to verify that that service is medically necessary. Um, in addition, PCAs or nurses who accompany a student on transportation, if the nurse or PCA is accompanying on specialized transportation, you're gonna bill for one or the other, but not both. If you have a PCA or a nurse 
who is riding that transfer to just a regular bus with that student, you can bill for that PCA or that nurse, but you would not bill for the transportation. So it's a little bit different, um, but really, I mean, it's, it's, especially from the CMS perspective, they see this as clarification of what was the original intent. So about, about the PCAs? Okay, so on that, on that last bullet about a student who is accompanied either by a PCA or a nurse, okay? You cannot bill for both of those services at the same time. So, you know, so they correct, okay. I mean, I think I, I gave a couple examples of how you might pay one versus the other. So if, you know, and that comes down to probably a conversation with your business manager about, you know, where do we, where do we want to, where do we want to see this? So if, so not for that. So if the student has, um, if the only reason that there's quote unquote special transportation is the presence of the nurse, you should be billing for the nurse or the PCA. So you're not, right? And if you've got a student whose nurse stays with them the entire day, if that's part of, if that nursing service is billed through the day, they're gonna start billing with the arrival at school is my understanding. Is that ever true? The kid is only on special transportation spot or rarely is So uh, if if I could add, um I think part of the um logic here is that that PCA or nurse cannot be the direct service claim tied to the transportation to let it go through. Yeah. So, so um, otherwise we'll have to discuss either in the Q and A or online. Yeah, thank you, Devin, for that clarification. All right, let's go ahead and move on um, to the next fun subject, which is the random moment time study. So we, we've, there's been lots of, of chat and discussion around the two-day window. Um, but in addition to the change within the window, and I will tell you that right now, Pennsylvania with five-day notification response is a serious outlier. It's amazing that they're still allowing us, you know, had still allowed us to do that. Um, and my understanding is when they initially drafted this document, you know, to provide additional guidance, they wanted to go to zero, zero notification, like, and, you know, very minimal for response time. So, but there was a lot of uproar from the various states who were working through those changes with CMS. And that's how we landed at this two day notification two-day response. Um, so as we said, we're going to kind of phase this in with two-day notifications for the October to December quarter, but we're not going to make that two-day response window hard and fast until 25, 25, 26. Um, we're just encouraging you to move in that direction. I know there were questions around two days versus 48 hours versus what happens if it's on a Friday versus a contractor that only, there's a lot of situations and I will compile all of those and send them to the Technical Assistance Center um, and, and see kind of what we get back from CMS with regard to um, how they view those kinds of situations. Um, the other, of course, is the July to September quarter. Um, and this is another instance where 
we don't have a choice. Um, this was drawn out in the review of Pennsylvania's program and CMS is not standing by any prior um, guidance or information that would have suggested that we could keep July to September as inactive. There are going to be a lot of questions about what that looks like. I don't have answers today. Um, we're going to be reaching out to you all um, in order to better understand what happens in your LEAs between July and September so that we can determine how we need to craft this quarter. Because unfortunately, we're not going to escape it. So, all right. I think with that, it's back. Is it back to Devin? Back to me. Look at that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't have the clicker. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. So. Well, we might call you back in a moment, Jennifer. So. <laughs> Talking about medical necessity. So we've had a lot of questions about medical necessity, amount, frequency, and duration, which are required to bill MA. Um, now this is not the same requirement as IDEA gives you for the IEP. So sometimes you are meeting IDEA's requirements, but not MA's requirements. And this is something that we talked about in one of the earlier slides. But IDEA comes first. That is your requirement. MA can follow. Um, this was addressed in a few different sections. This part here, um, this highlighted change is in 2.1. Um, and what we're talking about is the amount of services that a student needs at one time. So how, how long is the session? Um, we used to call this duration of the service, but what we're really talking about with duration is the duration of the authorization, which typically follows the IEP length. Sometimes it doesn't, and if it doesn't, that needs to be put on there, um, on the authorization. And then frequency, our terminology there has not changed. It's how often does the student need the service, and marking a number of services throughout the IEP year is not a frequency. I know that you want it to be, but it's not. Um, so we have put out a fact sheet about this and included daily, weekly, and monthly. But now after um, conversations between education and Medicaid, we have added quarterly um, to represent per nine week quarter. And that was from Right. Yeah. So that came out of as as we got all of your feedback that came in through um, coffee hours and that that kind of thing. We took that and sat down with our medical directors um, within the Office of Medical Assistance Programs and talked to them to put out, OK, what of these will meet that Medicaid definition of medical necessity. So that's where this more limited list is coming from, is our medical directors. And unfortunately, IEP year did not make that cut. So um, this is our new authorization form. It will be effective on 10-1. So authorizations up through 9-30 will use the previous two forms that are still up on the website and they will remain effective for their full authorization length. So you do not need to get anything re-signed on the new form. It's still going to work off that old one. Um, we're gonna cover this more in some of these changes in the next slides, um, but we are also going to have a targeted max capture training. Sherry and I will be doing that on November 21st. You can access that um, registration link on the SSG training calendar, um, and we hope you will attend that. So specialized transportation, Jennifer talked about the um, vehicular accommodation section there. So we need to know 
what the accommodation is to the vehicle, and we need to know if it's one way or round trip, um, if it's daily or weekly. Um, Deb would know better for me than me for this in audit, but um, we need to know how often the student is getting that service. This um, screenshot here, the most common physical adaptations, that's straight from the CMS guidance. Uh, and we will have a link to that in this presentation so that you can go directly to it. We also shared it in some of the previous sessions. I do recommend that you look at that guidance. Federal financial participation percentage? Participation. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. Sorry about that. The question was, what is FFP? <laughs> and that is federal financial participation. Um, okay, so here we have added into the handbook that note that the presence of an aid is not specialized transportation. That is a separate service. Um, so if a student requires that service, that can be billed as that service type, but not as specialized transportation. Assistive devices was also adjusted on the authorization form to, it was added to the authorization form. This actually does not replace the authorization form for the purchase of an assistive device that's still in the claiming for assistive devices packet. Um, this is to document the ongoing need of that device so that we can better cover repairs We've had a lot of issues where um, the student's name has changed or the authorization was received over three years ago. Um, so we are looking at documentation and this clearly demonstrates the ongoing need of that device. We also adjusted that in the handbook. Um, so we've added to that list of examples of claimable devices. We've removed any examples of non-claimable devices. If you want to claim for something, submit it to us and a team of medical directors or a medical review will review it to see if we can pay for that for you. Um, we've also added that the, um, goodness gracious, I lost my place on this slide. Um, so you can bill up to $18,000 per student per year using this. There are other options for how you can um, get reimbursement for assistive devices. You can purchase it with your FAI funds and then claim that later on your cost report. That's another option. But with that, you, um, you as the LEA own that device. If you're claiming through MA, you have to give it to the student. And then evaluations. So somebody asked in a previous training, is the new form going to replace the other form and the initial evaluation form? Yes. Um, so that form is going away entirely. It's all on one form now, and it's through those check boxes. We need to have an evaluation authorized before we can bill it. So it needs to have the signature on or before the date of service for billing. And we have a chart here. This chart is not in the handbook, um, but the descriptions are. Early intervention, nothing changed. And um, just as a note, in Max Capture, there is a way to for the system to know that it's the child's third birthday. So if it lands on a holiday or a Sunday, it will still go through and you should not be changing the date. Um, and then for school age, it's either the IEP meeting date when developing an initial IEP or the last date the evaluation activities happened with the student, the last direct service that was um, done for the evaluation. That's very similar to what it was before. So hopefully it will be a pretty natural rollover. And then throughout the handbook, um, Jen covered this as well. So evaluations can be billed even when they don't result in the need of ongoing health-related services. The student just needs to have the IEP 
and the authorization for that eval. Of course, they also still need to be MA eligible and have a parental consent. All those other things need to be marked off as shown on the slide. Throughout section three, we have adjusted billing limits for each service type. And this was based on a 2023 review of utilization um, and what is reasonably, reasonably expected within a school day. So there were only two service types that had usage over our reasonable limits. And those were personal care services and social work and counseling individual. Those are the only service types that you should be seeing as denied for that reason over the billing limit because otherwise you were already using them within the new limits. Actually, typically what will happen is that it will only pay to the maximum number of units that is allowed. So if you build for 24 units and the max was 18, then you'd see an overall reduction because you're only getting paid for the 18 units instead of. And as a reminder, because this is a cost-based reimbursement model, the interim payments are not going to affect your overall reimbursement for the year. Um, so even if you are seeing a reduction in those personal care services or in those social work services, you're still going to see that money back at cost settlement. Telehealth, so all language has been updated from telemedicine to telehealth. And uh, we've also added the place of service distinctions regarding telehealth. So it depends on where the student is when the service was delivered. If the student was at home, it's the 10, the place of service 10. If the student is somewhere other than home at the time of the service, mostly we see this happening where the student is at school and the provider's at home. That would be the O2. Um, and you would mark that in Max Capture as other or home for telehealth, but that's just been updated in the handbook. Okay. Personal care services had some significant changes this year. So CPR certifications must include the hands-on component to be valid for SBAP billing. This is consistent with the Office of Childhood Development and Early Learning. Um, and if it's a fully online certification, it is not considered valid for SBAP services. They will return, we, re, be recouped. They will be recouped in an audit. Um, so that has been added into the handbook. And then in the examples of services section of PCAs, we changed that bullet about cueing the student to pay attention to break it out into a bullet and a note to separate out that information about educational activities. You cannot be billing for educational activities. And to specifically call out that the PCA is actively redirecting the student's attention because of their IDEA disability. That can be billed. Um, those are the only times that that can be billed. Gosh, I'm gonna have to go to the keyboard. This is not working anymore. You got me, okay. Okay, so some other service type changes that are outside of the billing limits and telehealth changes. Audiology services, we marked that they are individual only for SBAP. Um, this is not new. It's already been an existing thing on provider logs and on the authorization form, but it was not in the handbook, so we added that in. Orientation, mobility, and vision services can no longer be billed when delivered via telehealth. This was also based on a 2023 review of appropriate service delivery for this category. And then social work and counseling, we added in an example of service, which was 
historically on the provider logs, but not in the handbook. Next slide. Electronic records. Um, so we're seeing a move to paperless documentation, which is fantastic, um, but we're having to get creative. <laughs> so we have electronic records requirements laid out in section five of the handbook. In there, we have added this clarification about electronic logs because using a Microsoft Word or Excel document does not meet the requirements of electronic records, especially not for medical services. So what we've done is provide you with fillable PDFs that have the auditable signature fields and those are all posted on the SBAP website for you to use. They're also on the SSG site that you saw earlier. Um, and then we also have these two new forms with regard to Max Capture. So the Max Capture data entry of Direct Health Related Services Agreement, we need one per LEA. And that's because every LEA's services go through Max Capture for billing. And that makes sure that that um, service submission is protected in the case of an audit. The electronic signature verification statement, that's collected on your level. And that's for anyone who has a login to Max Capture. So access coordinators, direct service providers who are logging into Max Capture supervisors who are approving, all of them need to sign that form and your LEA needs to keep it on record. Next slide, please. Um, so again, for the max capture form, everyone needs to sign that and DHS needs to have that on file for your LEA. If we don't have it on file, we'll reach out. Um, we went through a lengthy campaign to collect those and I thank you all for getting them in. Um, at this point, we do have every participating LEA's max capture agreement. The uh, electronic signature verification forms, if you have any questions about those that you've collected, you can uh, ask us, we'll look at that for you, but we are not collecting those at this time. Audit trails for electronic signatures are necessary. They need to have that date and time stamp in order for us to um, be able to say that that was that person's signature. Otherwise, it's not protected. This is true for every single document that your LEA signs. So whether it's signed by hand, the audit trail would be the signature and the date field are written. If it's signed electronically, it's that we have the date and time stamp linking to that individual. These requirements show in these sections of the handbook, so please refer to them and reach out if you have any questions. Next slide. Oh, that's it. All right. So we're going to close our portion of, well, we're going to close this uh, session today with uh, just a review of the, the quality and compliance uh, area of the handbook. And a lot of this is what we discussed this morning when we talked about QARs and the oversight and monitoring process and documentation, um, but just some highlights and some additional information. Um, again, back to the quality assurance reviews, because this is really an area um, of our of our compliance and, and monitoring um, that has has changed uh, quite a bit um, uh, since since the last handbook update and. Um, so we've worked with SSG uh, to revamp the, qual the QAR process just to be more comprehensive, be more value, you know, something of more value for, uh, for the LEAs. And again, it's a, really a conversational um, interview type of, of a review where you would sit down with, uh, with your liaison uh, from, from your area. Um, and you'll you'll walk through documentation um, and and program components. Look at how your LEA is doing things, how you're retaining information, um, getting tips on how to make improvements in that process. Um, opportunity to ask questions. 
and really that's that's setting you up for success should you be um you know selected for an oversight monitoring review obviously setting you up for success when it comes time for cost settlement um or comes time for an audit through bpi you know, so all of those things are kind of interrelated the quality assurance review really is just a check-in um, an opportunity for you to make sure you're on the right track um as I mentioned this morning, um, approximately 15% of participating LEAs in each um, in each area um, of the state will will participate in a quality assurance review each fiscal year, and we try to do those on site when possible. Uh, just to look at some of the areas that are covered um, under under a quality assurance review, um, you'll talk about direct service, um, and you know a self audit process, which Deb described in, de in detail this morning. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide here. Um, random moment time study and the components of that, they'll look at these various areas uh, related to RMTS. Um, cost settlement, um, deadlines, the desk review process uh, that SSG will, that SSG works through, uh, Medicaid administrative claiming, forms, financial data, certification deadlines. And again, if you're if you're chosen to participate in a QAR, um, I'll be your department contact. Um, your regional liaison will be your contract through contact through SSD, SSG. You will receive email notification uh, from them notifying that you've been notifying that you that you have been selected uh, to work on a time frame to schedule that review, um, et cetera. And then ultimately at the end, uh, you will receive a written report summarizing your QAR, um, walking you through what was discussed, identifying areas for improvement, et cetera. Um, again, we're back to the self audit that we talked about earlier. Um, so you'll be asked to, asked to uh, do a self audit um, in advance of your QAR, um, and you're encouraged to do regular self audits. And when we talk about self audits, uh, you're not, not necessarily asking you to do a self audit of the entire program, but one way that we've discussed with uh, some LEAs early as we were developing this process that might be helpful is to select a different area of the program, say monthly or quarterly, uh, whatever works for your LEA to look at and do a self audit of that area. Um, each quarter, you know, each each month, whatever frequency works for you. There's there's no specific rule here, but just an idea that you would focus on a different area of the program uh, within your LEA each time you do a self audit uh, to run through a check and and evaluate how well you're doing here. If there are opportunities for improvements, if questions come up as you're doing that self audit, obviously please reach out to us. Uh, via the help desk through the department, uh, reach out to SSG, uh, to BPI if it's appropriate. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work through those things. The idea is that you don't come into one of these reviews and get blindsided or, you know, so as the self audit is a way to, to help you in advance of being selected for one of these reviews um, when that should have, be your turn to be selected. And again, that ties into, we wanna show you how this is all interconnected. Um, these QARs tie into the oversight and monitoring process, which is just another level of quality control um, and, and compliance. Um, the oversight and monitoring reviews, as I mentioned this morning, uh, that we, we select approximately 10% of all, out of all participating LEAs every fiscal year. Um, those LEAs are notified, that's, um, that cycle usually run notification usually begins in in January, uh, and then uh, you'd receive a you know electronic communication via email from from SSG and also a letter from the department notifying you that you've been selected, laying out the time frames and the process. You'd get access to SSG system where you would go be asked to go in and upload documentation to support uh, information on your through your cost settlement uh, that was entered through cost settlement. Um, <clears throat> We continue to work through a slight backlog on these reviews, um, which when I began working with the program was quite long. Uh, we're slowly chewing away at that. Um, our goal by the end of this calendar year is to be finishing up fiscal year 1920. Um, so 1819, uh, we're, we're constantly, 
the reviews have already been done by our contractor, by SSG, but uh, we then do an internal review. Uh, we work through an audit of so many of those reports just to make sure they look right to us, things look accurate before we notify, send notification out to the LEAs. Um, and that takes time and we're, we're slowly working through that backlog. So uh, notification on the, um, and, per, and the uh, issuance of the 1819 reports uh, will happen by the end of September. Um, and then there's a process where um, after an LEA receives their report, uh, they have a 30 day time period to review that report, take a look through it. Um, if something doesn't look right to them, say uh, missing identification or missing information was identified in a certain area of the report and an LEA happens to have that information on hand, we give them an opportunity to say, hey, actually, I do have that information right here and I can, I can share it with you. In that instance, we would, update, we would update the report and issue you a new report to update the findings. Um, so there's that, there's that interim period there where you have an opportunity to make edits, changes to the report before a final report is issued. And then once a final report is issued after that 30 day period, uh, you do have appeal rights for a certain period of time, which is outlined in a letter that you would receive with the final report, um, explaining the appeals process, should you choose to, uh, to go through that if you did not agree with the findings of the report. Um, and again, we're, you know, so by the end of 2024, we anticipate um, working through uh, it, the issuance of the 1920 uh, oversight and monitoring reports, which will put us about two, two fiscal years behind and just with the nature of the reviews, we do always run retrospectively. So we're always looking backwards. Uh, so we're, we're never gonna be you know, on the current fiscal year with these reviews, they're always, they're always slightly behind. And again, as questions come up through this, I'm your contact person for those for the department um, and our partners at SSG also you know, um, have, are, are available to answer questions, especially as you're going through the process with them of uploading documentation and things of that nature. And I'm just sharing some resources here with you. Go for it. This slide shows some section references to um, specific subjects that we covered today that are in the 2023 guidance. So the 2023 guidance is there. And then the specific sections for each of those topics is listed behind them. And then of course, you can always email our resource account. Um, we've also got our direct emails there. And then the survey link, please again, um, we love hearing your feedback. And we are collecting those responses until October 4th. So please, um, there was a survey link for each of today's four sessions, and there will be four more tomorrow.